the biggest night in Bellator history is here. The featherweight title rematch between new division king AJ Mercenary McKee and former champ Patricio Pitbull. Plus, the light heavyweight Grand Prix final, champion Vadim Nemkov, Nemkov pouncing, versus top contender Corey Overtime Anderson. It's game time, baby. It's a Bellator blockbuster. Friday, April 15th, live on Showtime. April 16th. Money, don't make no money. One of the top pound for pound fighters on the planet, undefeated world champion Errol Spence Jr., takes on title holder your Dennis Ugas, hot off a career defining win. Oh! One epic stage, two dominant champions, three world titles on the line. Time to put up or shut up. Spence versus Ugas for the Unified Welterweight World Championship, Saturday, April 16th, live on pay per view. All right, here we go. <laughs> it's the last stand and here is your host brian custer that's right it is the last stand. we bring you the biggest names in the sport when you talk about the welterweight division our guest is at the top he's the unified champion i'm talking the wbc the IBF welterweight champion of the world. He's known as the truth. Errol Spence Jr. joins us here on The Last Stand. He's been a while. Welcome back to The Last Stand. How you feeling today, man? <laughs> yeah, <I'm in. laughs> I'm not going to lie. My shoulder yeah, is sore. really sore. <laughs> this is sore. This is sore. The one thing I wasn't anticipating right here is sore. Oh, yeah. yeah the punches oh, yeah. right there hurt. Yeah, 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 Those the hurt there. Hey man, it's all good, man. <laughs> Just imagine though, you had to come the next day, yes. and then the next day, yes. and then the next day, yes. and then keep coming and working out and training hard. So. Let's talk about the big one because in April, Showtime pay per view, you're back, taking on your Dennis Ugas. He's got the other belt, the WBA belt. When you step in the ring with Ugas, what kind of fight do you, are you expecting? All action, chess match? I say when we start, I think it'll be a chess match. Um, you know, I think he's a thinker, but in the later rounds, you know, you just get the ball rolling and he starts to fight. Um, I see the Sean Porter fight, you know, it was more kind of a chess match that he was trying to do, and then it just broke out into a fight with the Pacquiao. It was more of a chess match on his part. I think for me, I'm going to use a chess match. I'm going to try to box him. I'm going to use my jab and, you know, try to use our game plan. And then it might turn into a fight where we both in there toe to toe and you know we're going to war. So it's gonna be a great fight. Yeah. Ugas has thrived on fighting top level opponents on short notice and getting the victory. Now he gets a full camp to prepare for Errol Spence Jr. So tell me why Errol Spence Jr. is gonna win this fight. Oh, I just feel like I'm a better fighter all, all around. I mean, even who who do you beat short notice? Well, you Pacquiao. Yeah. He, he took out Pacquiao on short notice. Even the, the Sean Porter fight. I mean, and there's a number of people thought he should have won that fight. Yeah. They, they didn't count the knockdown there. Yeah. Uh, and then the fight before that, he, he took on short. So it's like he's, he fights these top level guys on short notice and generally comes out victorious. Yeah. I think with the, I mean, the Sean Porter fight, um, it could have went either way. I, I thought Ugas edged it out. Um, with the Pacquiao fight, you know, he was already training for the fight, you know, to be on my undercard. And then once I dropped out, you know, he just feel, he filled in. So, I mean, he definitely did his thing with Pacquiao, even though I think Pacquiao was, you know, shelling himself mm. in that fight. And I felt like that was my, you know, basically not coming out party, but that was like my basically, I was going to become that, you know, superstar. It was kind of like how Terry Norris when he beat Sugar Ray Leonard. And then, you know, the notoriety came and he became, you know, that guy. So I think that's when I was going to become that guy. It's like when Floyd Foss, De La Hoya, you know, he transitioned to that guy. So I think that was mine. And then, you know, the eye injury. So Ugas took my spot and basically, you know, beat him. So, you know, I feel like, you know, 
for me, I feel like I'm the better fighter. I think I, I got the better skills. I got the better, better talent. And, um, you know, I got the better coach. And uh, we come up with a great, great game plan and strategy. And I think, you know, it's going to it's gonna be, I'm going to have the victory. Mm. After uh, you beat Danny Garcia, you said the following, quoting you. I was 75 to 80 percent and rusty. Um, that was nearly 14 months after your car accident. And then you said a lot happened uh, even in this camp. What happened? Oh, man, I was, I was really just banged up, you know, from, from the accident. I mean, we, when you get into a, a car accident and then, you know, you, you get thrown from the car, you know, 30 feet in the air and land on, you know, solid concrete. Concrete, I mean, you know, it's going to be a lot of, you know, different complications and things like that. Even, you know, me going to Cleveland Clinic and, you know, getting fully evaluated. And uh, they told me I can continue with my boxing career. You know, it was just, you know, a lot of still, I had a lot of nags and different pains, you know, in my body. But, you know, it's the fight I wanted. You know, I didn't want a tuna fight. I didn't want somebody that I know I could beat. I wanted somebody who was going to make me, you know, raise my game to the next level to have to beat Danny Garcia. So that's what I did. But, you know, it was just a lot of stuff going on, just coming back, I think. Probably a little bit too soon, but you know, just believing in myself and my abilities, and and knowing that you know I could beat Danny Garcia, and uh, you know that's what I did. And so, if that happened, it was 14 months after the accident, and you said, "Look, I was rusty." When we see you fight Ugas, it's going to be nearly a year and a half since we've seen you in the ring, and you're coming off eye surgery. Why should we believe we're going to see the best of Errol Spence Jr.? Because, I mean, I've been training hard. I mean, anybody who watched me spar, watched me train, you know, they know I've been 100% focused. You know, since I've recovered from my eye injury, I've been in the gym, been training, been staying in shape, you know, doing everything, leaving none st no stones unturned, you know, for this fight. And, you know, as you see for the Danny Garcia fight, like, I wasn't, I say I was 75, 80%, but I still gave up my all. I still was an entertaining fight. And I still came home with the victory and uh, I put on an amazing show, an amazing performance, you know, against a world champion like Danny Garcia, former world champion. So, you know, same thing with Ugas. I think Ugas is going to bring out the best of me. He's a guy, he's not really a boxer. Um, I, th I think he's a guy that's, he's patient, but, you know, he always presses forward. He always presses the action. So I think... You know, that's going to make fireworks. Cause if you know me, you watch me fight, you know, I'm not the guy that really get pushed around or like to get backed up or let somebody take the momentum away from me. So it's going to be a very entertaining fight, and I think it's going to be fireworks. And um, even if I'm at 90%, it's going to be fireworks, and it's going to be a great entertaining fight, and I'm going to give them all. Any doubts, uh, even coming off the eye surgery? No, no doubt. So, mm -hmm. I mean, like I said, I've been sparring. I've done 12 rounds, you know. At some point, I've done 13 rounds before, you know. I think I got hit in his eye. I got hit in the other eye, you know, with flush shots. And, you know, nothing happened. So, I'm pretty sure that it's going gonna, it's gonna to hold up against uh, the guys. When, uh, and we, I remember talking with Derek about this, and he, he said he even remember in camp when you were getting ready for Pacquiao and you had taken a shot, and you're like, oh, ah. It messed with your eye, but you just kept on spawning. Did you know then that maybe you had a problem? And and when you got the the notice right before the fight, like, hey, you're gonna need surgery. I mean, what went through your mind? You're thinking, man, I just went through this accident. And now this? No, nah, I didn't know. I didn't know I had a redness tear, but I do remember when it happened because when the guy hit me, like I felt like a little. I heard a little pop. And then I, I went back to the corner, I'm like, man, my eye or whatever. Derek looked at my eye, things like that. And then I actually came back out there and sparred like four or five more rounds. And then two days later, I had sparred again. And then it was, I had to go to the, to the, to the eye doctor to do my exams and stuff like that. So I went to the eye doctor, he looked in there and he was like, he was like, man, something going on with your eye. I can't really tell right now because I ain't got the, um, the stuff to really just look deep inside your eye, but it's something going on in there. You need to go see an eye specialist or whatever. And then even even like before that, like when it happened after my spar, I did see a little shadow up mm -hmm. there. But 
I didn't want to say nothing. I didn't want to say nothing because I'm like, I mean, if I say something, you know, they might, you know, get me out of the fight or say I can't fight or something like that. So I was like, like, you know, nothing. Everything there. was good. Yeah, everything was good. Like I said, I went to go see the eye doctor and I was just like, he was like, do you see like a little shadow to you? your far, your far left? And I was like, I mean, I see a little something, but it ain't nothing too crazy. Yeah. Like it's not disrupting my vision or yeah. whatever. And then he was, he was like, all right, I'm gonna give you this. Um, he gave me something to go see an um, eye specialist or whatever. But I actually didn't go. We went to to Vegas and went to go see the, um, I think it was the commission's doctor. I went to go see the commission doctor. And the commission doctor looked at my eye within two minutes or a minute. He was like, I got some good news. I got some bad news. He was like, the bad news is there's no way you can fight. He was like, the good news is I mean, it's partially detached, so I mean, they can put it back on, but you know, there's no way you're gonna be able to fight. And I was like, so I can't have this, even if I don't spar anymore, because I got one more week to the fight, and if I don't spar anymore, anything, I said, can I, can I still fight? He said, I, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to like get in the eye, move around, do whatever I gotta do. You know, I just wanna fight. Mm-hmm. And he was like, you're gonna lose. He's like, you, you, lose, you might, it's a possibility you might lose your eye. He's like, I can't let you fight. And I was like, <laughs> in my head, you know, I'm just being, you know, dumb. I'm just like, man, I got another eye. <laughs> I got another eye. <laughs> yeah, I, got the, like, I got two eyes. Like, I can see how both eyes, you know, fine. You know, I'm, you know, I'll be good. You know, he was like, nah, there's, there's no way I can let you fight. And wow. Then, you know, th- Looking back at it now, you know, I'm glad I didn't, you know, take that fight because that could have been, you know, my last fight and that could have, you know, messed me up permanently. So, you know, it was a good thing, you know, stuff happened for a reason and things like that. So basically couldn't have a fight. So I flew back to Dallas, um, had my eye surgery immediately and uh, had to sit out for like rest for like five weeks. Cause I didn't know a lot of stuff like you do with your eyes, like even like when you lifting weights, you know, it take, you know, eye stress mm-hmm. or when you run it's eye stress and things like that. So I couldn't do nothing more, just walk. And basically, you know, they said I couldn't even lift up heavy stuff, anything like that, like I could just walk. So after the five, six weeks of, you know, just being, uh, you know, just resting, you know, I started working out and I've been working out ever since then. Wow. Um, can you give me, and you remember, just your thoughts, because you felt like that was going to be a legacy fight for you. What, what was your emotions, you know, when you got that word and he said, "Hey, look, you know, can't fight. You're not gonna have to have surgery. You could possibly lose your eye." Just your emotions. Yeah, I'm definitely mad. I, you know, I was like, "Damn, man!" Like, you know, this was like basically, you know, my, you know, my, you know, Ray Leonard when Terry Norris fought Sugar Ray Leonard, like when Floyd fought. De La Hoya, like, you know, this was basically my coming out, basically my crossover, mm-hmm. my crossover field, because that's what, you know, Pacquiao brought, you know, he's a he's an icon of the sport, and everybody knows, knows Pacquiao, you know, so that was basically, you know, my coming out, and, you know, for that to happen, I was like, man, you know, and then at some point, you know, I, I was just like, fuck it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it is what it is, you know, stuff happened for a reason, you know, can't dwell on it too much, you know. Just got to get back in here and stay focused and, um, you know, I get the winner. And I actually watched the, you know, Pacquiao Ugas fight. I was like, you know, watching Pacquiao fight, I was like, man, <laughs> that should have been me. Yeah, I could have hurt this yeah, guy. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, man, I could have hurt that man. I was like, damn. <laughs> I was just like, you know, hey, it is what it is, man. Did, um, did it hurt you that immediately once you had to pull out of a fight, there were a number of people got on social media and was like, he just didn't want to fight Pacquiao. He's not really hurt. There were a number of guys who even questioned, even people who were fighters, former fighters, uh, came out and questioned whether or not your eye injury was was serious. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. For me, like you say former fighters, like Bernard Hawkins. Yes. Yeah, he came out and said, I'm like, what, like, what are you talking about? Like, why would I potentially, the, that was the biggest money fight. You know, I had, you know, so many endorsements for that fight and things like that. And I'm gonna put out that fight making all that money, the notoriety, the popularity out of the game just for winning that fight and probably would have transitioned me into a, 
you know, a bigger star than I am, and I'm going to pull out that fight a week before the fight. You know, why, why would I do that? You know, just for having people to question me and then, you know, his fighter, you know, drop out of fight. And I'm like, why don't you question him about it? And then, you know, he didn't say nothing about that, you know. So it was just crazy to me having people, especially people who, it was crazy having people who boxed before, you know, telling me that I put out a fight, especially a fight of that magnitude. That's like Bernard Hawkins putting out a fight, you know, a week before he had to fight De La Hoya. You know, people have been like, oh, you put out that fight? But I mean, you crazy. Why, that, that's a life changing fight for me. Why would I pull out that fight? You know, so for me, that was that was crazy that he even, you know, said something like that. You know, I could see people who never boxed before or, you know, you got hecklers or people that, you know, trolls that, you know, on Twitter, Instagram, social media that say little stuff. Oh, he put out a fight on purpose. He didn't want to fight Pac-Man. But for somebody, you know, that, you know, who I held in high regard, like Bernard Hawkins to say something like that, I was like, why would he say something like that? Yeah. When have I ever pulled out a fight? When have I ever missed weight for a fight? You know, so it was it was it was kind of crazy to me, but you know, it is what comes it is. with it. Yeah. Um, since the accident, you have really been on this. I don't want tune-ups. Um, I don't want lesser opponents to fight. I want nothing but the elite opposition. Why? I don't believe in tune-ups. I mean, <clears throat> I feel like, you know, my pedigree, I feel like I'm the I'm the best fighter, especially at 147, I'm the best fighter in the world. And um, I already wasted enough time, so there's it's no time to waste. Why would I waste, you know, fighting a tune-up and I already know I can beat him? You know, I got better spawn partners than, than a tune-up. They give me real fights, you know, bigger guys and things like that. So I, I'm a waste, you know, my time and other people's money for a tuna fight, nah, give me, you know, give me somebody who can really fight, who's somebody who has a name, who has the same status, and somebody, you know, I can beat and be like, man, that that's a tough fight. Like Ugas, people are like, man, he coming off two, two year, a uh, year layoff, a year and a half layoffs to fight. Ugas, like Ugas, tough fighter. He just beat, you know, the biggest, the biggest fight of his career, Pacquiao. You know, he has a belt. He's hungry. And um, you know he's coming to fight Ugas, man. That's that's big, and I want. That's what I want. I want to fight. If I'm fighting on Showtime pay per view, why would I fight? You know Joe Blow or you know somebody I post a knockout. You know that don't get me really the ambition to train harder. Mm. You know fight somebody like Ugas who's hungry, and I look in his eyes, and you know I don't see fear. You know for me that makes me train harder. That makes me more focused. That gets me more pumped up, and make sure I I gotta stay on my p's and q's because. This guy's not playing with me. He's not an opponent. He's not somebody that I could just walk over. He's somebody that, you know, I hit him in the mouth. He's going to try to hit me in the mouth back. So that's somebody that, you know, that I really want. I want somebody who's going to raise my game. And actually, when I wake up in the morning, I'm like, yo, I got to put these mouths in. I got to train 100% because this guy really going to come to fight. Thus, how Big Fish, oh, yeah. what, you came up with Big Fish now. The biggest. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, I, I thought you said something that was really uh, profound at the, at the press conference for this fight. You said, nobody appreciates life like a man who has cheated death. Explain that. Uh, well, I wouldn't say cheated death because I feel like, like I said, everything happens for a reason. You know, so I wouldn't say cheated death at all. I feel like, you know, I'm here for a reason. And I feel like when you get something almost taken away from you, you know, it makes you respect it more. And it, it gives you, just give you a new sense, it gives you a new sense of worth. And, uh, you know, basically it boxing, it gave me a new sense, life, life and boxing, a new sense of worth because, you know, I, I'm not gonna lie, at some point, you know, especially in boxing, like I was like, you know, I wasn't going to the gym probably for like two months or sometimes training. And then I get in training camp and I got to lose, you know, 30 pounds. And, you know, it's even harder, you know, you got to lose weight and get in shape at the same mm. time, you know, especially. So, you know, with that, you know, I wasn't in the gym 24 seven. I wasn't, you know, fully 100% focused. And I feel like boxing is a, it's 365 days, you know, it's a 24-7 grind, you know, it's every day. 
And, um, you know, I wasn't living like that. I wasn't doing it every day. But, you know, once the car accident, you know, happened, it kind of like, hey, man, you almost lost this. Because, you know, even like Al and Otto, it was like, you know, they weren't sure that I was on box again, especially, you know, them hearing about the accident and them coming down and, you know, seeing me, they was like, Yo, this dude ain't ain't boxing again or putting in any more gloves, anything like that. And you know, I seen people on Twitter talking about I'm a shell of myself and you know, I won't be the same, or you know, there's no way he'll beat, you know, Danny Garcia. And I'm like, okay, yeah, this is gonna make me train hard and more focused. Like even like with Ugas, you know, I see people, you know, saying little things, saying, Oh, you know, even, you know, with the eye injury, he's gonna make him more timid or you know, he's not going to fight the same or it's this and that, this and that, this and that. And I'm just putting it all in my brain, cackling. It's like, okay, it's like, we're going to see. Like, she's saying it. She's saying I'm screenshotting everything. I'm just putting it in the folder, just, just looking at the motivation, 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 motivation. You know, I eat it all up. So, you know, I use that motivation. I don't use it as, you know, as, oh. Uh, I let them put me down and stuff like that. I use that motivation, like, okay, now I'm gonna grind, I'm gonna train harder, I'm gonna be more focused, and I'm gonna prove you wrong. And, you know, I might get on Twitter and say something to you. <laughs> yeah, you, you are a good read and a good yeah. follow on Twitter. I yeah, gotta admit I might, that. I might get some Twitter after the fight and say something to you, just like when George Foreman had said, it was George Foreman and Ray Leonard. They said Mike Garcia was gonna beat you. you. Yeah. yeah I, Ray actually apologized to me. <laughs> he was probably like, man, my bad, you know, saying that. He was like, that's the same thing. That's kind of, I understand, it's kind of the same thing. If Marvin Ali would have said Marvin Hagler would have beat me and things like that, or somebody with the time Hearns would beat me, I'd have felt the same way. And I was like, you know, probably you said that, you know, yeah. I appreciate that. But like, you know, when George Foreman and I was just coming out saying Mike was going to beat me, I'm like, man, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I> tripping. <laughs> like, especially when like Ray Leonard said yeah. it. I'm like, Ray. That was your guy. Yeah, yeah that, that was my guy. I'm like, Ray, you saying that? You know, <laughs> this dude's going to beat me, man? Yeah, yeah. That was like somebody saying, you know, like his his idol was saying, oh, man, Duran going to wash him. Man. Right. Like, yeah, nothing for Roberto Duran. You know, he would have felt some type of way about that too. Absolutely. You know, I, you know, felt some type of way about that because you know I look up to Ray Ray yeah. Leonard like you know he's one of the goats. So for him to say that that was bad. It wasn't. I didn't really too much care about Joe Foreman. It was just more you Ray. Know, yeah, Ray saying. And know, I remember when we had Ray on the last stand. I remember you you sent me a thing and said. Because he, uh, Ray said, "Hey, I love Errol Spence. He is he's probably the top <laughs> guy." And you, I remember you sending me a response like, "He didn't say that uh, in that Mikey Garcia yeah, fight." Yeah, <laughs> like I don't, I don't let that kind of stuff go. Like I, you know, I read everybody's stuff. I read everybody's stuff. I see it. You know, I just use it as motivation. You know, it's never gonna, it's never gonna not make me do something or not make me less less focused. It's gonna give me more focus and more hungry and more dedicated. So. I use it all as fuel. I'm never gonna knock you for saying, you know, something bad about me because it's more motivation for myself. So. Got it. Do you have an explanation for uh, how you're sitting in front of me, talking about another major fight, still being unbeaten, yet you've gone through a major car crash and had eye surgery, and still here on top? Uh, you feel like it's God's plan, you know. <clears throat> I don't really have an explanation for it because, you know, I can't, you know, it was it was out of my control, you know, the car accident, you know, out of my control, me surviving, you know, out of my control, you know, even the eye surgery, you know, that was out of my control, you know, it could have been career ending, both of them could have been career ending, but I mean, I think God gave me the will, you know, the power, the focus, and the determination to bounce back from it all. You know, I didn't go through physical therapy when I got into my car accident, anything like that. You know, it was basically, you know, on my own, me walking, and, you know, me stretching by myself and me going to the gym. So just, no physical, you did everything uh, on your own? I didn't do no physical therapy. You know, me going to the gym and uh, hitting the bag, you know, arms hurting, the shoulders hurting, you know, in pain. Uh, me walking up the steps sometimes, walking out. I lived on the 24th uh, store, uh, 24th floor, so. I walked up a lot of times by myself, you know, just, you know, it was just the grind, man, just the motivation, just, you know, having my family take care of me, my girlfriend, my mom, my dad, you know, Jordan, 
you know, my sisters, you know, my kids, just seeing them every day. It was a motivation to keep striving and um, giving them more. And me wanting more too. It's like, it seems like your life is totally different now. You know, you unified champ, you're living in downtown Dallas, just high <laughs> rise, right? <laughs> yeah. Now I'm looking at you, you're on a ranch, you know, you got acres upon acres, you got goats and cows and how has your lifestyle changed since you've made this change here the way you live? Um, it was kind of 360. I mean, you know, I was saying the high rise, you know, I had a Ferrari, you know, things, G-Wagon, things like that, you know, just driving different cars and stuff. And, you know, I feel like I need to change, you know. You can't do the, keep doing the same thing over and over and over, you know. So um, I need to change, need something different, need a peace of mind, you know. Tired of just seeing people every day, having to go in the elevator, go up and, you know, see different people downstairs and stuff like that. I just wanted to be, you know, serenity, you know, by myself, peace of mind and quietness. So um, I did hire a realtor, you know, they were trying to give me houses in Frisco and all that with neighbors and things like that. And I just went on Zillow, the Zillow app, and I was just searching myself late at night, just on there searching myself and then looking for land and property and stuff. And then I don't know why, but I just stopped at this property and I looked at it, I was like, man, I wanna live out here. And I ain't never fooled with horse before, never fooled with cows, chickens, goats, <laughs> none of that before, <laughs> just dogs. <laughs> so um, I was like, I told my mom, I was like, I wanna go look at that property. So I went out there and looked, and then went out there a second time and looked, and I was like, you know, I want it. She was like, you, sh you sure? I was like, yeah, I want it. You know, so, you know, got the property, you know, and just been out here, man, just been a peace of mind and something different, you know. Um, you know, with a high rise, your kids can go outside and play. They can't run around, you know, they gotta stay inside the high rise and just watch TV, but out here, you know, they go outside, do what they wanna do, run around play, you know, just be kids, you know, and that's what I want. I want to show them something different and um, give them something different too, you know. After I leave, you know, I give them something that I can pass down to them. So, you know, that too means a lot to me too, especially it give me something to do too. You know, feeding the horses, um, riding the horses, never rode a horse before until after my accident, you know, very therapeutic for myself, you know, different peace of mind, you know, just being around the animals and, them not talking because you get around people they just talk too much want to talk about you know boxing and other things and a lot of my friends know that's one thing that you know that I hate to talk about you know I hate to talk about boxing we just sitting there I don't want to talk about boxing you know I may talk about a couple of fights but after that I want to talk about you know something else and do something else I don't want to sit around talk, just talk about boxing all day like you look at my house I don't have I, don't, I have no boxing pictures, you know, in my house. You know, I got box pictures out here, but in my house, I have no boxing pictures at all. That's, that's funny. What, what do you think people are going to say when they see you feeding goats, <laughs> uh, see you feeding chickens, riding horses? They're going to be like, this is the unified champ of the world. He, this guy's more like the J.R. Ewing of Dallas now. <laughs> he, he's living on our country ranch. And what do you yeah. think they're going to say when they see this side of you? Um, I think they're going to say, you know, it's more reserved. I mean, I could be, you know, driving a Lambo or another Ferrari or, you know, doing what everybody else doing. Everybody else been doing, you know, living a high rise, buying a big, you know, mansion, big house and, you know, standing in there and basically becoming a slave to my money, you know, but I'm not, you know, I'm out here, you know, it's more therapeutic for me, you know, being out here with the horses and the chickens and, the goats and I don't really fool with the cows. I let my dad fool with the cows. <laughs> Cause actually a bull charged me one time. Yeah, it charged me and I, I stopped fooling with the cows after that. <laughs> Cause I was playing with the bull. I don't know why, but I was playing with it. And then like charged at me. And then like, I tried to roll, but I fell. I fell, man. Like one of the people out the movie, I was like, man. I was like, but the bull had stopped though. And I was like, I am like, I ain't pulling with these bulls and cows no more. So I mess with them. My dad messed with them. Okay. But the, you know, just being out here with the horses and chickens and it's, it's super therapeutic for myself, especially after the accident, just being there with them, just petting them, you know, learning how to ride the horses and, 
you know, I feed the goats. I got a, actually got a baby goat, still got a bit of a cord and everything. And I bottle feed it like three or four times a day. And, um, you know, that's therapeutic too for myself. So, I mean, it's helping me, helping me, you know, mentally, you know, yeah. and uh, keeping me stable and stuff like that. So, you know. How does it change you as a fighter? Um, it ain't really changed me as a fighter. Okay. You know, I'm still a, I'm still a, you know, I'm still a savage. So. Yeah, 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 you are. In the ring, yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it still had, it had not changed me as a fighter at all, but it has probably made me more patient, mm. but, as an aspect as how I fight, it hasn't changed me at all. Now listen, one thing that I know about you, and you've always told me this, is that you want to be, especially in this, this era, yeah. uh, the Fort Belt era, you want to be the first undisputed welterweight champion of the world. You've always told me that. That means you would have to beat Ugas, get that belt. And you know that also means that you would have to get the other belt, and that's the belt that belongs to Terrence Crawford. Yeah. Um, now that he's broken away with top rank, do you think that's an easier fight to be made in that it's a fight that we'll see probably at the end of the year? It should be. I mean, it's something that, you know, that I'm definitely looking forward to and it's something that, you know, I'm willing to work towards too. And, you know, after I get past the Ugas, you know, it could be, it could be an easy fight to make, you know, it just depends on, you know, stipulations between me and him, you know, I've been, but I'm not gonna break. You know, I'll take off my coat, but I, you know, I'm not gonna give it to you. So, I mean, I think you know it could happen, I, and I'm looking forward for that fight. I think it's a legacy fight for him and myself, and it's a great fight. I think you know it really. I don't think it's really what the people want. The people want that fight. You know, that's the fight that they really want. And I think you know it can happen. Mm. Um, I know you once said, "Hey, look." If we fight, it's going to be either 70 30, 80 20. Uh, what was that? Man, I was, I was, when Is I that posturing or what yeah. was that? At the, when did I say that? You know, that was. Yeah, I said it on, on, uh, on my girl Instagram, yeah. what's going on? But I was playing. Okay. <laughs> hey, man, nobody taking no 80 20, 70 30. Yeah, yeah, I was playing. I was like, because I was like, it's going to be 60 40. And I was like, yeah, he keep he keep you know he keep playing crazy. It's gonna be 70, 70 30 yeah. or six, or um or eighty twenty. 20, yeah. But yeah, I was I man, I was I was playing like I wouldn't I wasn't serious yeah. about that, man. <laughs> okay. Like people can't take jokes, man. Like it wasn't it wasn't nothing towards that. But despite you having most of the belts in the division, does it bother you at all in your core that you hear people say and even some boxing? Victor would say, yeah, but pound for pound, Terrence Crawford's probably the best welterweight and the most talented welterweight in the division. Does that bother you at all? Nah, it, it really don't bother me. I mean, it all depends on, like I said, you know, who says it and stuff like that. But nah, it don't bother me because uh, I know, you know, who's the best welterweight. And, you know, I guess people say the eye test or whatever it is, they feel like he's the best welterweight. But... Nobody knows who's the best worst way until we fight each other, so. How has your relationship, and your relationship with Derrick James, how has that evolved? Um, it evolved a lot, because at first, me and Derrick, we didn't talk to each other. I didn't talk to Derrick um, when we first started training, because I didn't want to train with him. And my dad actually paid me to, to <laughs> it was giving me money to train with him. So I started training with him, then, you know, our relationship developed, you know, like, cause he used to be a fighter and stuff like that, so. A lot of stuff he understands, so, you know, we'll talk and then we start talking about life and, you know, he starts talking about, I, start, I start having kids and we start talking about kids and, you know, start other stuff. So he's going to live life, so it's getting that different perspective from him, you know, it means a lot to me and him just, you know, guiding me, you know, and he's just telling me different stuff and, you know, telling me what, I, what to look for and, you know, what not to look for and, you uh, it might be somebody he's not sure of, you know, that he'll tell me about this one of my friends and, you know, it's like, hey man, you know, watch that person, you know. So, you know, I take heed and take warning, especially I take counsel to, you know, older people, especially, you know, when they telling me something because, you know, they didn't, they didn't walk before and they didn't step in the same shit that, you know, I'm going to step in. So, or, and they telling me, hey, watch out for that shit right there. Yeah. You're going to step in it, step around it. So, 
You know, it means a lot, you know, when older people just, you know, tell me different stuff and just, you know, make sure that I'm right. It means that, you know, they really care for me and they're not looking at their own interests and benefits. So. You know, I thought it was interesting because, you know, when we talked with him, he, he said the same thing. He said, you know, he started training you when you were a teenager. Amen. And he said the same thing. He said, he, I don't think he talked to me for the first couple of years. Amen. I said, really? He said, yeah, his father was paying him to come train. And he said, that. so I would ask him questions like, hey, did you watch that fight? Yes. You, did you do this? <laughs> yes. And he said, that was the level of our conversation. Amen. And then he said, eventually he started to open up and... And he said, but yeah, as the years have grown, it's been more like big brother, little brother. Yeah. And he goes, I, I truly care for him. He said, now I'm still his coach, but he knows that I truly care for him. And you, you always see how sometimes those relationships go awry, but it just seems like yours has always gotten stronger. Oh yeah, because I mean, I'm an introvert, introverted person, you know, just naturally anyway. So, you know, it's gonna take me some time to warm up to you and things like that. But once I warm up to you, and once I start talking to you, and especially if I'm calling or texting you and things like that, you know, it means, you know, we locked in. So, you know, I'm not going to do anything that's going to abuse our relationship. And I hope that you won't do anything to abuse the relationship because I'm going to take it. You know, I take it, you know, I'm strong about, you know, my emotions towards, you know, somebody that I'm super cool with. So, and uh, with Derek, you know, he's just been, you know, a super big brother to me, like just telling me different things and making sure that I'm on the right track and making sure that I'm not doing anything crazy or, you know, he tried to, even with like Jamel, like he tell he tells Jamel the same stuff that he tells me, you know, I more take heed to it. Jamel take heed to it too, but he's more like, he'll still throw it out the window because I guess he gets so worked up in his emotions because I'm not super emotional. Like some people be like, like Al could tell me something and I'll be, I'll, they're at, they're like, I can't tell if you're excited or not because I am not the type of person to just be overjoyful or my voice change or anything like that. I'm like even kill. You know, my motto is never too high, never too low. Like I'm always, you know, at the same, at the same length every time, so. Listen, I know you're going to be biased, but I got to ask you this question. In your opinion, is Derrick James best trainer in boxing? I think so. Why? <clears throat> um, it's just, you know, I feel like great training inside the ring, you know, he pay attention to details. Like, even with me, like, a lot of times I get frustrated. And he don't mind you getting mad at him, too, because, like, a lot of times, like, you know, I get mad at him or I used to get mad at him a lot. like. Like, keep your hands up. And I'm like, my hands are up. He was like, I'm just reminding you, just, just in case you drop it. I'm like, man. <laughs> or he'll take me to jab, or he'll take me to step to the side. Or it would be some days, like, we'd do strength conditioning. And then he was like, why are you not moving? Like, I, I tell you to move. I'm like, we did strength conditioning on my legs. Like, <laughs> my legs tired. Like, <laughs> you can't expect me to keep moving and things like that. So for me, he always expects the, 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 the most. The most, you know, he always, you know, he wants top tier, you know, work. Like even with me and Jamel, like, like it, it been times me and Jamel been in training camp, and I don't see Jamel, Jamel don't see me. Like he'll work out 11, 12, I work out two or three. You know, we don't run into each other, nothing. He makes sure we have our own times, and you know, he give us, he give us our own, you know, the, the for training camp, he gives our own time and everything like that, and. Just pay attention to details, you know. And, um, you know, I just feel like he's the best because, you know, him working f with me from the ground up, even in the amateurs, you know, he changed my whole style. And you see me in amateurs, I was a guy that, you know, moved around the ring, just threw a one two, you know, didn't really have an uppercut or hooks or anything like that. And he switched me all up to, you know, going to the body more and using my jab and being more fundamentally sound. Even with Jamel, he changed Jamel up. He made Jamel a knockout artist. <laughs> Jamel started, Jamel got with Derek and started knocking people out and, you know, having more power and um, believing in his defense more and um, just be, believing in his abilities more and sitting down on more on his punches. And just looking at from that aspect, how he's changing fighters and, um, you know, making them better all around. Like even like Frank Martin, like, Frank Martin, I think he's 
way more exciting now than he used to be. You know, he's sitting down on the punches more. He's getting more knockouts, and um, you know, he's just gonna get better and better. You know, as as you know, he start keep working with Derek. You know, and keep improving. So, I just feel like he's a better fighter. I mean, a better trainer because I feel like he's helped he's helped us out tremendously. He changed my style. He changed the male style. You know, he's changing Frank Martin's style a little bit. You know, he's just tweak little things that we need tweaking and um, just making a better fighter overall. We're talking with Derek. He he felt like he said, "I think I've been robbed a couple of times for trainer of the year." But it's conceivable, Errol, at the end of this year, he could have two undisputed champions in his stable. I don't think any trainer could say that. You know, what does that say about him? What does that say about the stable that you guys have put together? Well, it don't say nothing about the stable we put together, because I mean, you know, that's that's all that's all his doing. You know, um <laughs> getting getting the fighters like Jamel came to me, you know. And they asked me, he was like, hey man, you mind if I work with Derek? I was like, nah, I don't mind at all. You know, so he started, he started working with Derek, but that says a lot about Derek though, because, you know, he's um, becoming a coach with two undisputed champions, you know, that's huge. You know, I think, you know, if he does that, I think he should get the Coach of the Year award for, you know, four years, <laughs> you know, just cause, just cause, yeah. just cause, you know, he had two undisputed champions, you know, in one year, you know, that's, that's unheard of. That's you know that's huge, especially in the four bill era. So I feel like they should have given to him for ten years, you know, for a decade. And just leave it at that. Uh -oh. You get coach a year for a decade, you good. Um, I, I I gotta uh, uh, ask you just about a couple of guys here. First of all, Mel. I mean, he's got an opportunity to become undisputed champion. Yeah. What do people not know about? I mean, they see Mel and they see uh, the boisterous, boisterous side of Jamel Charlo, and what do maybe they don't know about him as a fighter that you, you see in the gym all the time? They just see the outward stuff, the lines only, the flash, maybe him talking. But what did they not know about him that makes him on the verge of becoming an undisputed champion? I mean, I think as a fighter, they, they, they just, I mean, you get what you see as a fighter. I mean, he's a guy, he got a great chin. You know, he always come to fight. You know, he always fights the best guys that's out in front of him. You know, I feel like a lot of people don't see, you know, he really is, you know, a good person. He ain't, you know, he might have crazy interviews and, you know, he's super emotional. He's going to say whatever he got to say. And I think, you know, he's having a lot of stuff built up. And he's the type of guy, you know, he reads all this stuff on Twitter and on social media and stuff. And he let it all out. Like, as soon as he do an interview, like, he's going to let it out. Or he see a guy that was, was talking drunk, an interviewer. You're not gonna do it. He's like, nah, I know you. You was, you know, you was talking shit. You know, I ain't doing an interview with you. So he got it super emotional. He gonna let his emotion out. You know, he wear his emotion on his sleeve. You know, and that's you know, with me, I'm not a guy that's you know super emotional. I can see somebody. You know, I might say something like, yeah, you was, you know, you said such and such, but I'm not the type of guy that's just gonna be, you know, boisterous about it or just be like, you said this, man, if you this and that, this and that, you know. We just gonna let it out two different ways, you know. But I can't say, you know, he uses all that motivation too. You know, he might not like people talking about him, but he uses all the motivation. And I think, you know, he should keep that chip on the shoulder because, you know, I think it it propels him to be, you know, the best fighter that he is right now, and it makes him, you know, a great fighter because it keeps him training hard, keeps him focused, keeps him hungry because. He reads all this stuff and he's like, all right, you gonna say that? Bit. And it makes him mad and angry and it makes him want to train harder and it keeps him sharp and it keeps him focused. So I think, you know, he should keep doing what he's been doing because right now it's feeding the family. So mm. that's the, his motto keep running your mouth. Yeah, yeah. keep running your mouth. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, another guy, you, you mentioned him, Frank Martin. Um, he's under your banner because yeah. you're also a promoter. Oh, yeah. Is, he, is this like the blue chip prospect that you got? in Frank Martin that you think can be the next big thing, especially at 135? Oh yeah, uh, Frank Martin, he's, he's the next one up. Like I even tell him all the time, like, not all the time, but you know, I might text him or, you know, call him and just tell him, you know, stay focused. Cause you know, think about, you know, being a promoter, you know, I'm a boxer too. Cause I, so I know what traps out here for us. So, you know, I might tell him, you know, stay focused, bro, stay hungry, you know, 
you ain't there yet. You know, even when you're there, you don't. You want to stay at the top. You want to stay at the mountaintop because it's a, it's a, it's a long roll down. You know, if you fall, and it's always somebody thinking about it. when you at the top. It's always somebody you know looking looking up at you. You don't want to get to the spot where you at. It's home with people out there. So I was like, man, I'm always telling them to stay focused, stay in the gym. And he actually keeps me in the gym because when he in the gym, I'm in the gym, and he sees that. He see. Okay, man, he training, he's at the top and he's still in the gym working hard, you know, sparring and, you know, sweating, you know, sweat equity. So I think, you know, I think he can really do some damage at 135. I think, you know, he can beat those guys at 135 as long as he keep his head on his shoulders, you know, stay focused, stay hungry, stay dedicated, you know, he's the next best thing at 135. What do you want people to know? about Errol Spence Jr. I always get the question, I don't know if he's still the same guy after this car accident and he's had this eye surgery. What do you want people to know about Errol's the truth? Well, I mean, they should know from the car accident that, you know, I'm a guy that, you know, always gonna take the tough fight. I'm a guy that's gonna come to fight and um, I'm gonna put on a great show and a great performance and um, I'm gonna do it to the best of my ability. But um, you know, I don't. If you haven't watched my fights, then I mean, it's not much to tell you about who I am. I mean, my my work proves that who I am. You know, when I fought Kell Book, and you know, people say I come box, so I box Mikey Garcia. You know, people say, oh, he's a shut himself. He that's it's too early to fight Danny Garcia. I fought Danny Garcia. You know, they said, oh, he's gonna be timid and you know, gun shy when he fight Ugas. You know, I'm showing them that I'm not, you know, so I'm not too worried about, you know, it's to prove that I am what I say I am when I get in the ring. So I'm not the guy that's gonna tell you, you know, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that. I'm a proof of my action and my words, you know. I'm more worried about, you know, outside of the ring, you know. I'm more worried about my, you know, my three kids, you know, my daughter and my son, and, you know, make sure I provide for them. and. You know, people see, you know, I want to show a different, you know, perspective for athletes. You know, a lot of people think athletes, you know, jewelry, you know, cars and, you know, big houses and, you know, just splurge and just spending money on controllably and, you know, doing stuff like that. But, you know, that's not, you know, what I want to show my kids and things like that. I want to show my kids a different life where, you know, being out of the countryside, you know, on Saturday, my kids go out and feed the goats, you know, and feed the chickens and, you know, may pet the horses, you know. And then once they get old enough, I want to teach them, teach them, get somebody to teach them how to ride horses. And and I'm going to build a paintball course out here. Um, I'm getting a pond built right now where I'm going to stock fish. And, you know, me and my son are going to be on a boat, you know, going fishing and, things like that. So I want to show them a different way instead of, you know, going to the club. You know, that's cool sometimes, but not all the time. Go to the club and, you know, partying with friends and doing stuff like that. You know, I want them to have different hobbies and show them a different perspective out of life than, than just, you know, living, you know, that I would say, you know, that that image of you know Floyd Mayweather. A lot of people don't see like that image of Floyd. A lot of people don't see how how hard Floyd worked. Like people see you know Floyd. Floyd show that side of the partying and the girls and the money and all that because that appeals people. That appeals people. It's just like flies and shit. You know you lay shit out there, a fly gonna jump on. A lot of flies gonna jump on it with people. You know money, cars, jewelry. You know, the so-called, I guess, American dream, that appeal to people, that they're gonna, they're gonna flock to that. And that's what he did, you know, to draw the people in. That's why he became, you know, the biggest star in boxing because of that, you know. You know, he set the goal. But yeah. for me, you know, you know, it's something different for me. You know, like I said, you know, I survived, you know, a, a career ending accident, uh, you know, a life ending accident. And, you know, I just wanna show my kids something different and, you know, show my 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 nephew, my nieces something different and you know they can come out here anytime they want and you know have fun and you know do different things and you know I gotta and you know 
fish and, you know, shoot guns or whatever they want to do. They can do ride go-karts, you know, get on the four-wheelers and things like that. I just want to show them some different, a different way of life and, you know, not set the, okay, this is what you're supposed to do and just set them in a box. Nah, outside the box, this is not what you're supposed to do. Do this and do that. So you won't have to worry about, you know, all the social media stuff and, you know, you feel like you're behind because you don't have this car. Or you feel like you're behind because you don't have this type of jewelry and these watches and these chains and stuff like that. Like, nah, that's not it. Like, I had, you know, I had a, matter of fact, I'll tell you a story. I had a rich, I bought a rich meal because everybody was talking about the rich meal. Like, everybody, all the rappers get a rich meal, everything. So I got the rich meal. I said I had it for two weeks. I had it for two weeks, and I had it the first week, you know, I was like, yeah, I got rich and this and that. How much that set you back? Uh, about three something. <sighs> yeah, and I'm like, you know, I got the rich and all that. And then, like, the next week, it was just sitting in the safe. <laughs> it was sitting in the safe, I'm like, man, I called my jeweler, because me and my jeweler got agreement, like, if I don't want something, you know, I just, you know, take it back, and, you know, he'd, get, he'd give me money for it, for what I paid for it. So I, I sent it back. I sent it back to him. I went out there, sent it back to him. I was like, cause it just felt like the same. It just, it just got like the high was gone. Yeah. Like me getting a rich meal, the high was gone from it. And I was just, I had it. I was like, man, I bought this bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I bought this bullshit because basically, you know, all the rappers had yeah. it. You know, it was, you know, everybody was getting it. You know, who's who had it. Yes. Everybody had it. I'm like, man, I bought this for no reason. I could have bought. You know, I could have bought something else, yeah. you know, something that means something, something that, you know, that's a worth of value right. to myself, you know, not a watch. So, yeah. you know, it's just stuff like that, that, you know, like I got old school now, you know, I got an old school Cheville. I got three old school Chevilles and, um, you know, it's something I always wanted as a kid. Like I never wanted, as a kid, I never would care for a Ferrari and all that, you know, I will go, you know, watching Deuce of Hazard and all that, the old school muscle cars. You know, and still, and that's the thing that I wanted, you know. So, you know, I, I fell back into that, you know, getting my muscle car collection of kind of like how Rick Ross doing it. You know, <laughs> not to that scale, but, you know, I'm doing it. So, a more simple lifestyle. Yeah. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Brian Custer, and our new podcast partner is Athletic Greens. You know, I started taking Athletic Greens because I wanted more energy, and I got to say, I really love it. Uh, Athletic Greens, it doesn't taste like it's super healthy. It has that really mild kind of tropical taste. And I'm telling you, you're going to like it. So what is Athletic Greens? But I'm going to tell you one delicious scoop of AG1 and you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help start your day right. And it contains less than one gram of sugar. There are no GMOs and no nasty chemicals or artificial anything at all while still tasting good. And it supports better sleep quality, recovery time, and also supports your mental clarity and alertness. AG1 is a small micro habit of big benefits. And it's the one thing you can do every single day to take care of yourself. And it's lifestyle friendly. So uh, whether you eat keto paleo, you're vegan, you're dairy-free, or gluten-free, and it costs you less than $3 a day. And additionally, for every purchase, uh, AG1 is donating to organizations to help get nutritious foods to kids in need. In fact, no kid hungry here in the U.S.? Well, in 2020, Athletic Greens donated $1.2 million to kids. Now, look, we're going to make this thing simple because Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you've got to do is go to athleticgreens.com slash last stand. Again, athleticgreens.com slash last stand. Take ownership of your health and get yourself athletic greens.
Um, Errol, you know, everybody uh, who comes on the show, we allow people to submit uh, questions through social media. Yeah. Obviously, we've got a lot of them for you, but we'll, just, <laughs> we'll get through just a few here. Yeah. The first one says, um, from Ignacio, he says, when will Frank Martin fight next? And will it be another step-up fight? I don't know. It's something that we're working on right now, but he should be fighting around May or June. Okay. Uh, Fish from Twitter asks, when will you fight Jerron Ennis? Uh, I don't know. Um, you know, I actually, I'm not one of those older guys that, you know, they get mad or stuff like that when I'm older. I mean, a younger guy, you know, call him out. That's what he's supposed to do. Because if a dry in this or, you know, Virgil or T's, I see he just recently called me out. Yeah. Uh, like, if a lot of these young dudes didn't call me out, I'd think something wrong with them. Because, you know, when I was young and I was coming up, like, I was calling out everybody. <laughs> Keith Thurman, Daddy Shy, man, who wants smoke? <laughs> man, I was calling out everybody, like, man, who wants smoke? Man, I don't care what y'all talking about. We, we got to fight. Yeah. So, you know, you know, I respect that because, you know, if they wasn't calling me out, they'd be like, oh, it's coming. Or, I'm not really worried about that fight. I, I think something's wrong with him. He's not hungry. Yeah. Or he don't want it. You know, I, I respect the young guy. I was like, yeah, like, he the top dog. Like, yeah, I want him. You know, I'm gonna eat him. So they watching every move, they watching every fight. Like, yeah, he he's slowing down a little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna catch him. So, you know, I respect that. So I don't know when I'll fight Jerry and so we'll see. Okay. Uh, Renee asks, how much longer do you see yourself boxing? Maybe three or four years. Wow. It, it just depends. When the young guys start beating me up, somebody told me a long time ago, when the young guys start beating you up, then you know, it's, it's your time to retire. It's boring. Yeah, it's boring. Yeah, it's your time to retire when it, when you not when you see shots and you can't really react to them. You get caught with shots you shouldn't get caught with, and you know the guys that you've been beating up starting to catch you a little bit more and beat you up a little more. Then it's time to hang it up. So when the young guys just start beating me up and I'm starting getting beat up a lot, then I just be like, yeah, I'm done. It's time to hang it up. So. Uh, Texas from Twitter asks. Uh, when will we ever see an Errol Spence versus Virgil Ortiz, a Dallas showdown at Cowboy Stadium? Uh, I don't know. I mean, Virgil Ortiz got to carry his own weight for a I mean, Dallas showdown. He, showdown, he talking about at, um, what did he say, at, at uh, Cowboy Stadium. It would be a humongous fight. So, I mean, we'll see about that. I don't know yet. Next one from Twitter says. I got bigger fish to fry, man. Gotcha. Uh, next one says, is the plan to become undisputed and then move up? Oh, that is definitely the plan. That's definitely the plan. I got that's unheard of for a fighter to stay at a weight class, you know, his whole career. Yeah, yeah. Especially a big fighter like yeah. myself. So, you know, the plan is to definitely move up, you know, after I finish what I'm doing at 147. So it, uh, we got a number of questions asking about Charlo. Would you ever see yourself fighting Charlo? But if that means you move up, wouldn't he have to move up too? Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. you don't see yourself fighting Jamel Charlo, do you? Nah, I don't see myself fighting Jamel Charlo yeah. unless it's, you know, a crazy amount of money. Yeah. Where we got to feed our families. Got it. Interesting. That would yeah. be something there. Bro. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, that put Derek in a hell of a predicament, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but nah, but nah I, don't, I don't see myself fighting Jamel, but it was, it was some money that you know, like a crazy amount of money mm -hmm. that, you know, that could, you know, feed both our families. I don't see why not. Yeah. I mean, basketball players, you know, play each other, you know, best friends um, like Isaiah Thomas and uh, Magic Johnson was best friends. They played each other and they canceled out, you know, uh, the game, the playoff game because they were best friends. Yeah. So even the football players, they play each other too, boxing a little bit more because, you know, we punch on each other. Right. But but I mean, if it's for the benefit of, you know, our family and stuff like that, I don't see why, you know, that couldn't happen. Well, heck, it I wouldn't mean, be no bad, bad blood with me. Right. I was going to say, I, I, we've seen, you know, guys get a guaranteed 30 million yeah. and it plus the pay-per-view. Yeah. Yeah. That's got to be enticing. Um, uh, another one from Twitter says, will we ever see Spitz versus Thurman in the future? <laughs> I don't know about that. Yeah, I don't know about that. But I wish him the best, though. <laughs> that sounds like a nice way of saying no, huh? <laughs> There's just something about Keith Thurman with you, huh? I 
no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here we go. Uh, Chuck. Chuck says uh, from Twitter, will we get Errol versus Bud next for the love of God? <laughs> <laughs> We'll see, man. We'll see. <laughs> okay, Errol Spence, we've come to the last segment of the show. We call it the last thing. I'm just going to ask you a series of questions. Give me the first thing that comes to your mind. You ready? Mm -hmm. All right, here we go. Uh, when it comes to uh, the truth, is it the motto more man down or is it big fish? Shit. I ain't man down nobody in the, <laughs> in the wild, so I guess it's more big fish. <laughs> um, in your heart of heart, does Errol Spence really want to fight Terrence Crawford? Oh, uh, definitely. Um, what's your ultimate goal in this sport before you hang him up? To get the most out of it, um, become the best fighter that I know I can be and to leave this sport with my mind intact, mm -hmm. you know, because that's, you know, a lot of fighters, you know, you hear of, you know, a lot of these great champions that you hear of from back in the day, you know, you know, messed up, you know, dementia and, you know, just beat up, black, battered, you know, broke, and, and they gave, you know, everything to this sport, you know, and I call this sport unforgiving because, you know, a lot of their money and, you know, finances, a lot of people took from them and, you know, they basically have nothing. But, you know, they gave people the greatest and best fights, you know, and a lot of people asked them or they ain't had a heart for this, they ain't had a heart for that, they ain't had a heart for that. But a lot of them are, you know, broke right now, you know. A lot of them staying, you know, in old folks' homes or, you know, staying, you know, by themselves and completely broke and, you know, have nothing. And um, you know, for myself, you know, even when I first, when I first, my first, pro, when I first signed Al Heyman, you know, Al was talking about you know finances and talking about you know setting me up, you know, to you know for life after boxing, and you know, I'm like, I'm like 21, 22 years old. I'm like, man, what this dude talking about? <laughs> man, like, so he talking about retirement, come out career at the boxing and all this and that. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I haven't even got started yet. Like you talking about, you know, finances and career at the boxing. Like, I mean, I'm trying to get stuff started. Yeah. Like, but you know, as now, like, you know, I see I see why that, you know, he was talking about that and like, like we talk about it to this day and, you know, just set me up financially where, you know, I'll be okay, you know, at the boxing and you know, I won't be one of those stories or one of those guys, you know, a great champion, but, you know, I have nothing to show for, you know. Interesting. Just, just have great fights where, you know, they keep showing on TV, but I have nothing to show for financially or anything like that. You know, I don't want to be one of those people. Um, once your days of boxing are over, and you said probably about round 35, you want to be yeah. out, will you become a, an actual promoter? Uh... Nah, that's too much work. Mm. Yeah, because a lot of these, something wrong with a lot of these boxes, man. Like, a lot of these boxes mentally, man, messed up in the head, man. So, I ain't got time to be babysitting boxes, a whole bunch of boxes. I can see myself having, you know, two or three boxes. Yeah. But having, like, a whole stable of different boxes, nah, because a lot of them got too many problems. Last but not least, by the end of this year, Errol Spence Jr. will be one of the greatest 147 pounders of all time. Mm, by the end of this year. Definitely. If, if, the way I see it, yeah. One of the greatest 147 pounders of all time. That's a, that means that you probably be that you would have to be undisputed. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know what I love more? Actually getting in the ring with you. That was that was oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah, that was dope. That, that was, was dope. awesome. That yeah. was awesome. <laughs> and, and let me tell you, I know you ain't, you ain't man down anyone in a while, but them punches hurt. <laughs> I can attest to that. <laughs> them punches that. hurt because I'm still sore. <laughs> but that was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, that was cool. Uh, folks, that's what we do. We bring you the biggest names in the sport. And I'm telling you what, none get bigger than Errol Spence Jr. I always appreciate you, my man. Thank you, man. I always appreciate, appreciate you. It. 
Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you again next week.